Parker Matipo is a brand new postdoc at CFA. He just joined us two weeks ago. And Matt is from Northern Ireland. He studied physics at Oxford University, and he got his PhD from Queen's University of Belfast in the UK. Um, today, Matt is going to talk to us about uh, what powers super luminous, luminous supernovae that have about up to 100 times brighter than typical supernovae. Please join me in welcoming Matt. All right, thanks everybody. It's nice to be here. Uh, as Yuan Yuan said, I'm brand new, so if you see me wandering around looking lost, please come and save me. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about superluminous supernovae, or SLSNE. It's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially these are supernovae or stellar explosions that reach absolute peak magnitudes brighter than around uh, minus 21. So uh, 10 to 100 times brighter than normal type 1A or type 2 supernovae. They're very rare. They make up about one in every 10,000 explosions. But because they're so bright, we find them as far away as redshift of around four. So this is just a comparison of normal supernova-like curves down here with uh, this pointer working, with, um, with these ones up here, the superluminous guys. So you can see they've been divided into a number of subtypes. So I'm just going to quickly go through those. So probably the easiest ones to understand are the hydrogen-rich or type two superluminous supernovae. And these are generally defined by these sort of multi-component bomber lines. Oh, the resolution is coming really bad. But if you take my word for it, there's uh, multiple velocity components in these lines. And the narrow lines in particular show um, flux evolution in time that indicates that it's from material close to the supernova. These aren't interstellar narrow lines. Uh, and this indicates that the most likely mechanism to power these explosions is a collision between the expanding supernova ejecta and the slow moving material close to the star. More interesting to me are the type 1 or hydrogen power superluminous supernovae. Uh, because they're a bit more mysterious. So their, uh, their optical spectra that run maximum light are shown here, and they're generally defined by a very blue continuum, uh, quite featureless in the red, and they've got these broad W-shaped oxygen-2 lines in the blue. And these objects are generally found only in metal per dwarf galaxies. But as they evolve in time, they start to look remarkably similar to normal luminosity type 1c supernovae. See a lot of the same lines here with similar velocity profiles. So that's very interesting. So a number of models have been proposed to explain the exceptional luminosity in these events. The first model people suggested was it's similar to a normal type 1A or 1C explosion in that it's powered by the radioactive decay of 56 nickel to cobalt to iron, except that in this case, instead of having 0.1 to 0.5 solar masses, you've got several solar masses of radioactive nickel. The second mechanism people have suggested is similar to the type 2 events, uh, a collision between the supernova ejecta and presumably some kind of hydrogen per CSM, because we don't see any hydrogen lines as these things evolve. Uh, and the final model is uh, a central engine, so the spin down of a millisecond magnetar or accretion onto a newly formed black hole. And it's kind of similar to the engines that people invoke to power GRBs, but the essential difference is that the energy input is on a longer time scale, so we don't form this stable jet. Instead, the energy diffuses out of the supernova once it's already kind of expanded to a large radius. So it mainly influences the luminosity rather than the kinetic energy. So actually, all these models can give pretty good fits to the light curves. So you can see here a pretty typical superluminous supernova, uh, 2013 DG. Uh, and you can fit the light curve with any of these for an ejected mass of around four to six solar masses. To do the interaction powered model, you need about half as much mass again in circumstellar material. So it's pretty extreme systems we're talking about. Alternatively, we could have the engine model. The magnetar shown here is fairly representative of the bulk of the population. It'd be a couple of milliseconds spin period and a magnetic field of some number of times 10 to the 14 Gauss. But we do run into some problems when we come to the nickel powered fits. So as you can see here, the nickel model requires pretty much as much nickel as there is total ejected mass. And that's pretty much incompatible with the observed spectra. You know, the spectra aren't dominated by nickel or cobalt lines. So for this reason, the nickel model is generally excluded when we talk about um, the normal type 1 superluminous supernovae. But there is an exception to this. So one event, supernova 2007bi, was proposed to be something called a type R superluminous supernova. And this is because the light curve decline is uh, noticeably slower than the other events. So you can see here, it fades by about one magnitude per 100 days in the optical. 
And this is reminiscent of cobalt decay. Uh, and actually, the light curve is well matched by models of what's called pair instability supernovae. So these are supernovae uh, only possible in carbon oxygen cores greater than about 60 solar masses. Uh, and these cores become unstable to pair production, which reduces the pressure in the core. It contracts and leads to thermonuclear runaway. And these explosions can synthesize 5 to 10 solar masses of uh, radioactive nickel. So this asks the question, uh, are the broadest hydrogen per superluminous supernovae actually powered by this totally separate pair instability mechanism compared to the normal uh, faster events? Uh, so now we've got some observations that can answer this question. Uh, we've got two new type R objects from PANSTARS, PTF 12 dam and PS 111 AP. And for the first time, we actually have a measurement of this rise time. So supernova 2007 BI is the red one. And it was only really observed during the decline phase. So quite surprisingly, our objects actually rise to peak in around 60 days rather than the kind of hundreds of days predicted by the parent stability models. And this relatively fast rise implies an ejected mass of only around 10 to 30 solar masses. And that's derived from fitting models to the light curve or simply from diffusion time arguments. And that's actually almost impossible to fit this light curve with realistic nickel-powered models. So in fact, our objects were pretty definitively not parent stability supernovae. Uh, well, if we compare the spectra then to 2007 BI. Uh, so PTF 12 dam, the first of our objects, was observed from well before maximum light. This first spectrum is about two weeks before maximum to hundreds of days afterwards. And you can see the spectrums are really good match for 2007 BI at any epochs where uh, both supernovae have been observed. But even more interestingly, the early spectrum of 12 dam actually looks almost exactly like the normal fast declining type 1 superluminous objects. And this seems to suggest that actually these objects do form a single class of explosions, a single class of hydrogen per explosions with a wide range in time scales. We also compared our spectra to some models of pair instability explosions. Uh, so this is an example here, this purple spectrum from Kaysen et al. And you can see the pair instability is really suppressed in the blue. So below 5,000 angstroms or so, the flux drops off very quickly. And that's because of line blanketing from the very large mass of iron uh, that's synthesized in these explosions. Uh, alternatively, the magnetar model, this uh, brownish curve from Desart et al, actually does a really good job of uh, matching the colors in this spectrum and matches some of the main spectral absorption lines as well. Uh, so the spectra are also strong arguments against the parent stability interpretation here. So just to show a couple of light curve fits, uh, just like the fast declining objects, we can fit these broad guys with both uh, interstellar, uh, circumstellar interaction models or uh, central engine models. So the top panel is a typical CSM fit. In this case, we need a really extreme ejected mass of about 26 solar masses and 13 solar masses of circumstellar material. So it's kind of hard to imagine a system with such a huge CSM around this star. But uh, that's what is responsible for the broad light curve in this model. In the central engine model, uh, again, you need a high ejected mass uh, of 10 to 30 or so, uh, and also a low magnetic field, or uh, alternatively, a longer engine time scale in more sort of general statement. Uh, the slower energy input gives a slower decline that then matches the sort of cobalt decline rate. So from all these kinds of um, case studies, what do we actually learn about the power sources in these events? So there's now probably 20 or 30 well-observed uh, hydrogen per objects that show a wide range of time scales, and they can all be pretty reasonably fit with both interaction-powered or central engine-powered models. So really what we need is a more systematic approach so our first attempt to answer this question, uh, we compiled the first largest sample of superluminous supernovae. So this is about 25 objects or so. Uh, and we measured the e-folding time on the rise and the decline of their light curves to see where they lie in this kind of parameter space. And it turns out that pretty much all the objects lie close to this uh, decline time equals twice the rise time kind of locus here. Uh, and this is also very similar in shape to, we've got some normal um, hydrogen per type 1 BC supernovae here, and they seem to lie pretty much along the same kind of line. So actually, even though we've got a very wide range in time scales between the fast and the slow superluminous supernovae, the intrinsic light curve shape looks kind of similar. Just a quick aside, you might have noticed there seems to be a dearth of events in this region with a decline time of around 50 days, which would then argue the opposite, that maybe there are two separate populations here. And it's actually very tempting to try and conclude that, but unfortunately with these low numbers, it's not statistically significant. So that's a question we'll have to come back to when we've got a bigger sample of these guys. But unfortunately, they are very rare. But what we can do with these uh, parameterized light curves 
is compared to the sort of general parameter space predicted by the models. So the magnetar model, here we've run a grid of models with spin periods of 1 to 10 milliseconds, magnetic fields 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 Gauss. And this actually predicts that, that most supernovae should lie along this kind of locus. Uh, it's hard to get up into this sort of upper left region because you need either a very low ejected mass or very extreme magnetar properties of huge magnetic field or extremely fast spin periods. So this indicates that actually this model is, is pretty good at explaining all the diversity in these objects with really just the, uh, the diffusion time or the ejected mass being the key parameter that drives you from down here to these longer declining events up here. Uh, what does the interaction model have to say about this? Well, in this model, we've got significantly more scatter. So this dashed line here is pretty much where our data lay. Uh, but you can get CSM interaction models all over the place. So these models that are linked up here are for same ejected masses and circumstellar interaction masses. But as you change this, the CSM density uh, from, you know, by an order of magnitude or so, you scatter all over this plot. So this is really problematic for the CSM model, unless for some reason all superluminous supernovae have really similar CSM density. So you can see the gray uh, symbols here with a density of around 10 to the minus 12 grams per centimeter cubed do tend to fall along where our data is. But there's no kind of obvious reason why all the objects would have the same CSM density. But uh, before I dismiss this model, I should point out that this is a very simplified model. It assumes a uniform shell. And perhaps if you had a more complicated density profile or more realistic density profile, uh, it would better represent our data. But on the other hand, it's hard to see why a more complicated density profile would reduce the scatter around this plane. So we've also compiled all the spectra for these same events. Uh, so here's a, a montage of some of them here. So we looked at all this, the spectra of all these events as they evolve in time. And at no point in time for any object do we see any evidence of slow moving material. See exclusively broad lines in all of these objects. So that's another point uh, in my mind against the interaction model. It's hard to see how you would hide the, uh, the narrow lines in all cases. From these broad absorption lines, we measured the velocities, uh, primarily from the iron two lines, of these objects as they evolve in time. So you can see these blue curves at the top are the superluminous supernovae compared to some normal type 1c supernovae down here. And there's a really substantial uh, difference in the velocity evolution here. The superluminous supernovae seem to show, in most cases, very flat velocity curves, whereas the uh, supernovae 1c drop off by several thousand kilometers per second in the weeks after kind of maximum light. And actually, this behavior was predicted in advance of these observations by the, the magnetar model of Kaysen and Bilston. So the, the uh, essential point here is that the overpressure from the central engine inflates a bubble in the ejecta and sweeps the ejecta into a dense shell. And this dense shell, as the photosphere recedes through it, shows pretty much constant velocity. So that was possibly a breakthrough in discriminating between these different models. Uh, from our measurements of these kind of velocities and uh, light curve time scales, we can make simple estimates of the ejected mass just from a simple diffusion relation here. Uh, unfortunately, we do run into one big uncertainty, which is in the opacity. So this top plot is the distribution. It's easier if we just look at this inset. The, the narrow lines here are the typical ejected masses for normal 1BC supernovae, and the broad curve is for uh, superluminous supernovae. If we assume that the two populations have the same opacity, about 0.1 centimeters squared per gram. And in this case, superluminous supernovae seem to eject, on average, about twice as much mass as normal hydrogen per objects. Um, with a tail extending up to around 30 solar masses. But on the other hand, some people have argued that superluminous supernovae should fully ionize their ejecta because of this uh, very luminous hot power source in the center. And if the, uh, they're fully ionized, we get about twice the opacity. And actually, the distribution of masses is, is quite similar, apart from this high mass tail. So unfortunately, we, until there's better modeling of these light curves, we understand the power sources better. It's hard to say whether they are unusually massive explosions or whether it's this high ionization. Uh, OK, so I'd like to move on to a slightly different topic now. Uh, the recent observation of double-peaked superluminous supernovae. So LSQ 14 BDQ is uh, an object we followed last year. And it's, the spectra here, it looks pretty much identical to your average superluminous object. So PTF12 dam from earlier, uh, 
PTF09 CND is another very well studied event. Uh, so spectroscopically, it looks very typical. In terms of the light curve, the green light curve here pretty much matches the slow rise of PTF12 dam, implied as one of these sort of high mass events. But the new observation here is this, uh, this area here. So the light curve shows a very fast kind of pre-bump uh, at early times. And this has only been seen uh, once before in uh, any superluminous supernova, which is this blue guy here, 2006OZ. Uh, in that case, it's, we just got these kind of three data points here. So it's clearly much narrower and under sample detection. So if we zoom in in our bump, you can see it more clearly. So it spans around 15 days and reaches an absolute magnitude of around minus 20. So the immediate question that came to my mind was whether this bump was actually some kind of normal supernova uh, before whatever mechanism that generates a superluminous second peak kind of turned on. So a normal supernova that then collided with something or something that, to that effect. But actually, if we compare the early light curve with normal uh, hydrogen per supernovae, it's, uh, it's quite different. No other object in the literature shows this combination of a very fast rise of only a few days to maximum uh, together with such a bright peak magnitude. And to illustrate this further, uh, we fit the light curve with a simple nickel-powered model. And to get this combination of fast rise and bright peak uh, required about 100% nickel ejecta, as well as a very high explosion energy. So if this bump is a supernova in itself in some way, it's certainly not a normal supernova, and another mechanism will have to be invoked to explain that. So the simplest um, idea to proceed on is that this is not a supernova in itself. It's somehow connected to the main peak. Uh, and if we compare the early light curve to other double-peaked normal luminosity supernovae, we actually see a pretty similar morphology here. So these are objects that were caught early in their evolution, typically nearby events, so 93J, 87A, uh, 2008D. And all of these objects show this early bump from uh, shock cooling emission. So the basic picture is that once the supernova shock breaks out of the ejecta, uh, the first emission we see then is the, um, the cooling of the outer layers as the supernova expands. Uh, and after that, the second peak is then driven by nickel decay. Or in our case, driven by a central engine or circumstellar interaction or some other model that no one's thought of. So we fit the early light curve with shock cooling models. Uh, so this is the model of Rabinac and Waxman, and this has been applied to the normal supernovae and returns pretty sensible parameters. Uh, the model depends most strongly on the radius of the progenitor and the ratio of uh, kinetic energy to ejected mass. So from our broad second peak, uh, we infer an ejected mass of around 30 solar masses. So we can convert the E over M to just an absolute value for the energy. And we fit this for a range of progenitor radii from compact around 10 solar radii up to an extended kind of red supergiant-esque radii of 500 solar radii. And in fact, if you look at the energy required in each case, it's, uh, it's pretty unrealistic to get such a bright early peak from a compact progenitor. 10 to the 54 erg is, uh, we don't know how to make an explosion with that kind of energy, even a parent stability explosion or something, we can't get up into that range. So actually to get a sensible fit to this early light curve as a shock cooling emission, you need an extended progenitor. And that's very surprising because this is presumably a hydrogen per star, and we didn't detect any hydrogen in the spectrum around peak. So how do we get a hydrogen per object that's 500 solar radii? at least. So one model for this uh, was proposed by Tony Pyro. He took our data and modeled it with um, a slightly more realistic progenitor structure. So the Rabinac and Waxman model is pretty much just a power law density structure in the envelope. He took instead a 30 solar mass, so our estimate for the main peak, a 30 solar mass compact core and surrounded this with low density material uh, extending to a large radius. So he modeled from 500 to 5,000 solar radii and found that this model reproduces both the fast rise and actually the low density material also allows for this fast drop off the first peak. So we got really nice fits for this. Uh, and this could explain the lack of hydrogen in the spectrum. If the other material is very uh, low density, it could be transparent by the time we reach uh, the epoch of our spectrum. Similar to how type 2b supernovae start off with helium lines, which they've lost by the time they reach maximum light. Um, what does the, uh, the double peak suggest for the circumstellar interaction model? So we've seen these large radii, uh, and that might immediately indicate some circumstellar material. Uh, if the shock breaks out of CSM, that immediately gives you the large radius. Uh, 
But the problem with that is it's very difficult to power the second peak unless you invoke a second shell of circumstellar material. So you need quite a complicated structure here to get a double peak structure from, from these collisions. Mariah and Maida had a very uh, tempting explanation in that the, the first peak is the emission before the collision. There's a dip whenever the, the two shells collide because the ionization increases as the outer shell becomes um, shocked. Uh, and as the opacity increases, we, we don't see the emission from the inner regions anymore. Then the shock proceeds to sweep through the outer material and drives the superluminous second peak. But the problem with that model, uh, in our case, is that it can't explain the fast rise of the first bump. Uh, if the first bump is a supernova before the collision, then there's no way we can reach, uh, we have to match the light curve with a normal supernova light curve, which it just unfortunately doesn't. So an alternative model was proposed then by uh, Case et al. And this is based on the uh, uh, central engine model. And in this case, uh, the insight was that as well as the late time diffusion energy that powers the luminosity, there should also be a hydrodynamical impact from the central engine. Uh, it, in theory, will drive a second shock through the already expanded ejecta, which can break out when the supernovas reach a large radius already. So this shock breakout doesn't look like the shock breakout from the progenitor. It's much brighter and longer time scales because of the, the large radius. But the problem with this model is that in their calculations, whether this uh, second shock breakout was visible over the normal supernova rise really depended on how efficiently the magnetar energy was deposited. So their conclusion was basically that we need more realistic calculations to know whether we really see this emission. So further uh, study of this bump phenomenon has motivated a search in the literature for do other superluminous supernovae show similar behavior. So I said it had previously only been seen for LSQ 14 BDQ and this supernova 2006 OZ. But actually looking through all published superluminous supernovae, there's a number of other objects, six other objects in this plot, that show a significant flux excess at early times. So compared to these polynomial fits to the smoothly rising part of the light curve, uh, these earliest points deviate by three or more times the errors on the points. And in fact, some of these objects show deviation over multiple epochs or in multiple filters. Uh, and in all cases, we can rescale the light curve of LSQ 14 BDQ to match the shape of this early emission. So all these objects are actually consistent with being double peaked. And presumably these uh, early points were dismissed as photometric noise by the original authors. So that's encouraging. These might be quite common. But just how common are they? Well, in fact, there's no superluminous supernova in the literature for which we can definitively exclude a bump. These are the, probably the most constraining limits we could find. But they're either too low cadence, you know, we don't have them at the right epochs, or they're not quite uh, deep enough to rule it out. These pan stars objects here are the closest we've come, but it's kind of marginal. So, so these bumps may be common, if not perhaps ubiquitous. From some of these objects, we had multicolor detections of the bump, as I mentioned. So we're able to try and reproduce the spectral energy distribution. And it turns out that it looks really hot. So the slope of the bump is consistent with a black body at around 25 to 30,000 Kelvin. And this is consistent with, both with the shock cooling models that, that we applied, and also with the magnetar powered shock breakout. So, uh, so to me, this bump seems like one of the most promising ways to try and constrain the progenitor and the power sources of these objects. Uh, it should give us clues to the radius, and it might be able to be the signature of a magnetar shock breakout or something like that. So we should keep searching for it, of course. And actually, this looks really promising. We should find more of them very soon. So this plot just shows, um, as you increase the depth of your supernova survey, how easily you can detect these bumps. So this red area roughly corresponds to the dark energy survey. And actually, they should be able to detect bumps, assuming that their intrinsic brightness is kind of similar across these objects, out to a redshift of close to 2. So uh, these future observations should be the best test of whether these bumps are, in fact, kind of ubiquitous or common. And the next step for understanding their physics would be to get a spectrum uh, during this bump phase. Uh, so that brings me to the end. Just to conclude, I would say that the central engine, specifically the magnetar model, uh, is the most consistent with our observations, including the line profiles, colors, velocities, and the time scales of the evolution of these objects. There's no evidence for parent stability supernovae yet. Um, so at least some of these objects are very massive, but it's unclear whether they split into two populations of fast and slow decliners. There could be a gap
but it's not statistically significant, and the spectroscopic evolution looks the same in both groups, so it's still unclear. Uh, and in fact, both classes show these early time double peak light curves, uh, which may be present in the majority of superluminous supernovae. Uh, and that's me. Thanks a lot. Yes, exactly. So it's a newborn neutron star formed in the core collapse with a spin period of about one millisecond and a magnetic field of around 10 that's to the 14 Gauss. Sorry? And that's what undergoes supernova explosion. Uh, yeah, so, the, so it's a normal core collapse explosion essentially, but except that the, the remnant is highly magnetized and rapidly rotating compared to an average neutron star. And that can then, the energy released as that spins down. Uh, so the it's the rotational energy is tapped by the magnetic field, essentially, that powers the extra brightness. Do you know if there have been Chandra observations of any of these? And if so, uh, at what phase in the light curve and with what results? Yeah, so, so this is interesting, actually. There's, there's predictions that these magnetar ones especially, we should see a break out of the magnetar radiation after maybe weeks or months from explosion. Uh, and people have searched for these. So there's one object. It was probably the first one ever detected, actually, SCP-06F6. It's a very high redshift object, and there was X-ray detections. There's been s several other objects where people have searched, but they haven't seen it. So in most cases, it's a case of you've got to look at the right time because you don't know when the X-ray breakout is going to happen. But there are, I know there are ongoing efforts to try and look regularly to see if we can spot this breakout again. That was at uh, several months after like curve peak, I think it was. It was late, yeah. And I was very surprised to find for that event because it's one of the highest redshift ones yet. So it was, it was very, very X-ray luminous, like like uh, greater than redshift one. I think that the X-ray luminosity was about ten to the forty-five orgs per second or something like that. Yeah. Um, can you look ahead a little bit and talk about the impact of LSST data on this field? So LSST will obviously find a lot of these things. Um, I think really the observations for me, it's the most important thing now is cadence. So people are, have recently been thinking cadence isn't important for these guys because they evolve kind of slowly. So for, for upcoming surveys, what I would like to see is uh, you know, if you image these every single night, you can resolve these kind of bumps and things. So LSST should definitely have the depth that we can detect these kinds of things if they happen. I don't know what the plans are for LSST in terms of survey strategy yet, the, the cadence and things. So I don't know whether it'll be good at resolving them or not. But it'll certainly find orders of magnitude more superluminous supernovae than we have so far. The key will be to pick them out of the data. It's hard to distinguish them based on the, the light curves because they tend to be at high redshift, so they, sometimes they just rise above the survey limits and you don't have very good uh, measurements of the rise time or anything like this. So, so it's, a, it's a big challenge, but because the numbers are so low as, as things stand, it's, everything's going to be a massive boost to this field, just find, some, find more of these objects. Just, just, just stick with that all. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, okay. So. So uh, this is going to be a progress report because, as you will see, basically, although we've made some progress, the things are still, I have to say, rather confused as to where we're going. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the radio mode AGN feedback. And uh, just for a start, I should just quickly go through what this is about for the people who don't know. Um, basically, one of the things that Chandra has shown is prevalent that at the centres of groups and clusters of galaxies, what happens is we very often see uh, AGNs in uh, massive galaxies. This is the case, in this case, it's Centaurus A. And what you see is you see a radio AGN there. So with radio jets, and it produces radio lobes here in the red. I hope you can see that the blue, which is the X-ray, is actually sitting slightly outside that southwest radio lobe as the shock is being driven by the expanding radio lobe into the surrounding medium. And we see lots of examples of these. This is another case, NGC 5813, where we see multiple cavities and um, shocks produced by these expanding radio lobes. The important thing for the purposes of discussion here is that there's energy that's deposited. It's deposited in the form of shocks, sound waves, turbulence, particles maybe, and all sorts of other things as well. Uh, that the details of that actually are not the ones I'm going to address today. I'm going to talk today mainly about how the AGN actually get powered. Um, and uh, there's, we can use these features to estimate the powers of these things. First of all, the minimum energy needed to inflate the lobe is just equal to the enthalpy, the sum of the internal energy of the lobe and uh, the PV work done in expanding it. And depending on the uh, equation of state, that's some multiple for relativistic gas is a factor of four times the pressure in the load, that is, times the pressure of the load and its volume. And the pressure and volume are relatively accessible to X-ray observations. So we've made measurements of lots of these. Then if we have an estimate of the age of the system, and uh, we have several ways of doing that, and there are some systematic uncertainties. But the thing is that we can, uh, well, we can use that to get a power, a mean power, and we can also compare other estimates. For example, where we have shocks, we can actually use the shocks and shock models to estimate powers as well, and the agreement's reasonable. So we're pretty confident that we can measure the powers of these things. And the result is summarized in this figure from uh, Andy Fabian's review. It's a compilation of results, and unfortunately you can't see very well. I've got plotted. Oh, by the way, we call the powers estimated this way, this way cavity powers. Essentially, it's, of course, an estimate of the mean power of the jet, but the mechanism that we use is based on the cavity properties, okay? So this shows cavity power here. The important thing to see is that we have a number of orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude in cavity powers. And on here is the power required to stop the gas that surrounds this uh, central galaxy from cooling, uh, what we call the cooling power, surprisingly enough. And the thing to notice here is that even though there's a large scatter and substantial uncertainties over these many decades, we see that there's a pretty good correlation between the power output from the jet and the power needed to stop the gas from cooling. In fact, you'll see that in these lower mass systems, they seem to be above the equality line a little bit. But in fact, when you allow for duty cycles, they're actually probably pretty close in the average to the line. So we've got a pretty strong case then that there is actually this AGN feedback happening. I just want to make one quick comment about an update on the information about this. Uh, one of the things that's been looked at recently by a student at Waterloo, Robert Main, was uh, how these jet powers depend on the mass of the system. Uh, unfortunately, these plots aren't coming out very well, but in any case, um, what we've got plotted here on the bottom uh, axis is uh, M2500 as a measure of the total mass of the system. And on this vertical axis here is a cavity power. We have a sample that's uh, basically the, the dark points in this plot are high flux uh, clusters, but we've supplemented with some more high powered system from Julie Le Lovacic Lorondo samples and also some uh, galaxies from the Rafferty sample that weren't in high flux. And you can calculate using self similar, self -similar scaling arguments that the uh, way you would expect this to depend on the mass is essentially, well, the cooling power, sorry, the power required to stop the gas from cooling should scale with mass essentially as mass to something like 1.75. There is some, by the way, uncertainty in that exponent there because it depends on gas fractions of which we actually have to measure the mass dependence of. But in any case, this is the sort of schooling you need, sort of scaling that you need. Uh, 
to stop the gas from cooling. And what you find is, in fact, that the observed uh, mass dependence pretty much matches that. There are, I have to say, fairly substantial uncertainties in the slope in this line because of the large scatter. Nevertheless, it looks as though the scaling works as you should expect. Perhaps, I mean, that's not so surprising given the other results we have. But what is perhaps a little bit more interesting is that we know that we can use, well, sorry, so let me come down here first of all. What this plot shows is it shows on the right radio power uh, versus the um, mass again, total mass of the system uh, measured by M2500 again. But what's being done here is that we've plotted the systems that have short cooling times, less than a gig a year, in as full dots, and the ones that have longer cooling times, more than a gig a year, uh, as open circles. And uh, what you can't really see, or I hope you can see, is that, well, first of all, radio power is a, a measure of jet power. I mean, this is uh, well known, and we've sort of calibrated this relationship, and in fact, that using that relationship in the mean, we've converted from radio power to uh, an estimate of the jet power over here. The important thing to see in this plot is that the correlation that you expect, the mass dependence, is there for the systems with the short cooling times. What you probably can't see very well is that the open circles, the systems with the longer cooling times, have a much larger spread in radio powers. In particular, their average powers are considerably lower than for the systems uh, that have the short cooling times. And uh, furthermore, if you actually look at this more carefully, you'll see that there also isn't a correlation between the power and the mass. So what this is telling us is that in the systems where you don't need the AGN feedback, you actually don't see a dependence on the mass, which is actually part of, an important part of actually showing that this AGN feedback model works. So this is an interesting result from, from Robert Main, a, a paper, by the way, that's been submitted recently. Um, the, real, the main topic I want to talk about, though, is how you feed the AGN, okay? And one of the things that people argued about from the outset when these things were found was whether you actually feed the AGN by accreting hot gas, that is by bonding accretion essentially, or whether it's actually the gas cools to low temperature before it falls into the AGN. And we showed some time ago in David Rafferty's work that, oh, again, I'm sorry, this is hardly visible, but the important thing here is that the powers that you get out of these systems in the more massive systems, they're insufficient from bond accretion to actually account for the uh, jet power. Uh, and, so, uh, and, and so, in fact, it, it looked as though at least for some systems you couldn't power them by body accretion, but for the lower mass systems you could. And, but then Steve Allen, of course, claimed that there was a correlation. But in fact, what's happened is that Helen Russell has revisited this recently and shown that there probably isn't, or at least there certainly isn't, a well-defined correlation between the jet powers and the body powers. So it really does look as though hot accretion is not going to work um, for any of these systems. It's not... Uh, not just the high mass ones. And of course, we get a feedback loop if it's cooled gas that feeds the AGN in any case. And furthermore, we've known for quite some time too, at least since 2001, that you see lots of cool gas, or at least cold gas, in the systems that have the shortest cooling times. That is to say, the ones where you need the AGN feedback most. And this has been done from CO observations, from um, Spitzer, Spitzer spectroscopy actually, looking for things like molecular hydrogen lines, in fact, as well as other features that you get, such as PAHs associated uh, with the cold gas. And then from uh, Herschel observations, where you're looking at uh, particularly the atomic carbon line uh, associated with cold gas. All right. Um, on the face of it, you might think that uh, getting uh, the gas to cool in these systems would be a trivial matter. We've got cooling, the gas is dense, it's going to cool down to low temperatures. But in fact, we need the gas to cool by thermal instability, and it turns out that there's actually a problem there. What happens is if you, if you have a dense blob of gas sitting in a, in a hot atmosphere that would be uh, cooling faster than the surrounding, so it might go thermally unstable, the point is if it's in a stably stratified atmosphere, it's also going to be denser than the surrounding stuff, and it's going to tend to fall inwards. And the time scale for this, well, it's, it's basically, strictly speaking, the technical thing is it goes into oscillations at the brunt of solar frequency. But in fact, there's always damping. But the important point is you can read from this the time scale on which it'll return to its equilibrium position is essentially the radius divided by the Kepler speed, which is essentially the free fall time. And so these bobs will return to their equilibrium positions 
in about a free fall time. And so if they don't um, cool very quickly, faster than about a free fall time, then they can get back to equilibrium and be stabilised. So in fact, you don't get thermal instability developing easily in these systems. And as I said, this has been known for quite some time. In recent years, uh, a few years ago, um, Sharma and uh, et al, Gaspari and others as well did simulations and they concluded that in fact what you need is you need the cooling time to be shorter than about 10 free fall times for the gas to go thermally unstable. Now I have to say this number has become a bit of a bone of contention uh, recently. I'm not going to talk about that at any length now but what I would say is that's probably an upper limit really I think. Uh, and in fact, I think there are other things going on. And in fact, we observe line emitting gas and molecular gas in systems that don't obey this condition. And so the question is, how can that happen? And the answer is very, well, not that simply perhaps, but it's not that difficult. The point is that this argument relies on the gas being supported by buoyancy only. If there's some other way of holding the gas up there, then it can go thermally unstable anyway. You could do that perhaps by rotation, if you have some rotational support. Or alternatively, what you can do is you can lift the gas outwards. Again, we know, for example, by looking at the distribution of heavy elements, that when the radio, radio lobes, they're buoyant, they rise outwards, and they drag gas up behind them. And, uh, and so if the gas is dragged up with the radio lobe, then it can go unstable as well. And indeed, Lee and Brian from simulations have shown that this can work, at least, well, yes, to, if you believe their simulations. So... Um, it's a small digression, but I just want to mention, too, that we see um, some fairly uh, good evidence that there is thermally unstable cooling going on in these systems. Again, in 2008, some time ago, David Rafferty looked at evidence for the presence of young stars in these systems. The way he measured it is by using colour gradients, which is what's plotted here. Along about the zero level here, below that are systems that don't have young stars in them. And the important thing to see is that the only systems that show young stars are the ones that have cooling times, central cooling times, less than about five giga years. So it's clearly an indication that you only see gas cooling forming stars in systems that uh, have short central cooling times. At essentially the same time, Ken Cavagnolo look, and uh, others looked at um, H-alpha, the presence of H-alpha emitting gas, and they found, well, they used a different measure. They used the central, well, this K0, which is a sort of measure of central entropy. But what they found was it's essentially the same thing. Low entropy systems are the ones that have the cool gas in it, the line emitting gas, H alpha emitting gas. Um, and you don't see it in the systems with longer cooling times. And at the time, uh, we argued that uh, jointly that basically this is because these systems are unstable by the field criterion, which in case you don't know, that's where the competition, in the competition between thermal conduction and radiative cooling, that the radiative cooling can win. This is essentially the criterion for that. Um, you need the thermal conductivity to be suppressed by some factor, but that's actually reasonable given the presence of tangled magnetic fields. I, I don't really have time to discuss this, but this is about essentially looking at the rotational support condition as well. And it turns out it's really ambiguous which of these criteria could really be setting this limit that we see here. Yes? Going back to the previous slide. Um, this one? Yeah. 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 Um, why don't you have uh, uh, you know, high points? In, in you mean why are there these, these systems? Uh, I mean, the short answer to that question is I don't have a good answer, okay? okay? Except that there's history in this, okay? I mean, stars don't form instantaneously, presumably, and uh, and the gas can hang around for a while, but it's not clear. I mean, the short answer is we don't know. Well, they look better, and it depends on what we plot here exactly, but yes, you're right. This is an issue. Um, so we see evidence, as I said, for outflow of hot gas from the distribution of heavy elements. We see where the radio lobes are rising. There, the heavy elements tend to be more extended. Um, there's also indications that the cold gas flows outwards, and the first a good argument for this was from Andy Fabian, yet again. And uh, this was based on the image by Chris Consolis, a narrow band image of the, uh, it's actually H alpha plus nitrogen 2 emission in the Perseus cluster. And again, because this is a lousy, uh, this is not a very good display, you can't see it. But, but there's a, a curved filament around there that's got this nice curved shape. Even worse, 
There's another one over here that doesn't show up very well on the original, but it's oh, clearly there. The oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the point is, as Christine is pointing out, you can see them here as well. This is just a blow-up. Uh, that is just a blow-up of that region there. And the point is that there's a bubble sitting up here above these. And if you look at these, they look just like the streamlines behind the bubbles in uh, buoyant bubbles in fluids, in liquids. And so Andy argued on the basis of that that this stuff is being dragged up behind the rising bubble. But of course, it's a, if it's line emitting gas, it's roughly a factor of a thousand cooler than the, than the uh, hot gas that's around it. But even more remarkably, okay, was that if you actually look now in, this is the, one of the row vibrational lines of a molecular hydrogen. This is made by Jeremy Lim, this image. Then, in fact, I have to tell you, when I first looked at this, I wondered if I was looking at the right image, because this is so much like that. It just looks like a bit of noise has been thrown on top of the image to the left. There's clearly very detailed correspondences. And in particular, you can actually see, well, maybe not so much in this display, I hope you can, that, for example, that feature corresponds to that feature there. So it looks as though if the line emitting gas is being dragged up, so is at least the warm molecular gas that gives you these row vibrational lines. So um, it really does look as though there's some outflow in the uh, much denser gas, okay, at much lower temperatures. Now, uh, now I'm going to switch on to the, um, uh, our ALMA observations. And this is a... Um, cycle zero observation of Abel 1835 that Brian McNamara was the PI for. Uh, over here, this is, uh, oh, this is for, yeah, Abel 1835. Over here is a Chandra image of the central region. You notice the scale is very small, but there are two small cavities in the middle of here, and indeed this sort of channel running between them. If you actually look at the uh, ALMA, this is now the CO32 line, so this is much colder gas but uh, you see these sort of two arms sticking up that stick up essentially behind that cavity there. What you cannot see, I'm quite sure, it, would have been, it was difficult enough before, was that we've got the line profiles for each of those little boxes there. And in the middle here, you see line velocities uh, of, of the order of 10 or kilometer, 20 kilometers a second displaced from the uh, zero here. But in this here, corresponding to that filament out there, uh, you see something going at 200 kilometers a second. Over here at 70, I think it is, and 60 over on the left on the other side, okay? So the point is that the highest velocities are in the gas that's furthest from the AGN in projection. And the point is that there are two possible explanations for this, that, or at least two obvious ones, I should say. By the way, I, the, the interpretation I'm about to give you is certainly not unambiguous, okay? No doubt about that. But it is the simplest interpretation you can give here. Uh, the point is that some people would argue the gas is falling in. But if it's falling in, then you'd expect to see the highest velocities closest to the AGM, OK? Whereas, in fact, the highest velocities, the highest separations in velocities are in the more distant parts. And furthermore, the actual values of these velocities are really quite small. I mean, I, I said, well, you've got 200 kilometers a second over here, but these are more like 70. So they're relatively small. And so the argument, the simple argu simplest argument, is this stuff is being pulled up in, by these cavities rising outwards uh, somehow. Okay? Um, there is an additional thing that we noticed with this, which was that there's an unresolved blob of gas in the middle. I, I, I should have said this before. The total mass of molecular gas in here is roughly 5 times 10 to the 10th solar masses, so it's a very large quantity. Um, the amount that's being uplifted is roughly... 10 billion solar masses. The rest of it is in an unresolved blob in the middle. And uh, we assume, just because it was the simplest obvious interpretation, that this was probably a disk in the middle, except that the full width half maximum of the velocity was much too low. These are sitting, of course, in central galaxies, brightest cluster galaxies, that have velocity dispersions of the order of 300 kilometers a second. So these numbers are much too low for the rotational speeds. So the only way to interpret this easily is to assume that you have a disk that's nearly face on. Now that by itself would be easy, except apparently all disks are nearly face on, if you, if you believe that. And so, in fact, I'll say more about this shortly. Um, so, uh, so basically, I just want to say a little bit about uplift. There are several ways that the gas can be lifted. 
One of them is they can just be hit by a jet and pushed outwards. The momentum in jets is substantial, but the problem with jets doing that is they're also narrow. And so the total amount of mass that can be lifted by a narrow jet is probably insignificant. The other mechanism that I've already mentioned is that you have these radio lobes. They're buoyant. They're going to rise outwards, especially when they're large. And they'll rise out quite quickly and drag gas up in the wakes. And again, this is shown in simulations. And it's also shown from looking at the distributions of heavy elements in these systems. So one possibility then is you just there's cold gas there. You're just able to sweep it up in the outflow somehow. Um, when you know what the masses involved are, that looks less and less plausible, OK? To lift 10 to the 10th solar masses of gas that way doesn't seem all that likely to work. You, you could, might be able to miss small masses, but not that sort of mass. Um, the alternative possibility is that, as I described before, that what happens is you lift gas outwards, low entropy gas from the core of the cluster. In the core, presumably, it's being heated at about the rate that it's cooling to stop it from cooling catastrophically. And when you lift it outwards, now it's no longer heated, and so it goes thermally unstable in the wake of the rising lobe and cools down to low temperatures. You, you need enough time to do that. You need at least a cooling time. Um, but simulations have shown that at least that this is possible to make this occur with, uh, I mean, physically, reasonably, uh, reasonably physical uh, simulations give you this as a result. What that would mean then is that as this gas comes out, it's, it cools at some stage. It might cool while it's still moving outwards, or it might have turned around and started to fall back in before it really cools to low temperatures. And so then the flow speeds that you see would just reflect the details of the history of, in the outflow. So this looks fairly reasonable. But on the other hand, we, we always see um, dust in this gas, I think almost without exception. And so it's a little bit of a puzzle how got, that got there, because as you're probably aware, in the hot gas, the dust should be sputtered very rapidly. And the question is how it could reform when the gas cools. I have to say, this has been addressed. I don't have time to discuss it here. But uh, it's, it's possible that it's not such an issue, um, because of course, there's gas being shed, dust sorry, being shed all the time by the stars in the galaxy, for example. Um, so. Uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about is our observations of Parks 0745. This is a paper that's being prepared by Helen Russell at the moment. These are cycle one ALMA observations, so better sensitivity and better uh, resolution. Um, and what we see in this system, this is the CO32 image, and what you see is you see these three filaments. Um, because you can't read anything on here, let me point. There's a cross in the middle there, which I can't really hold the pointer on very well, but there's a white cross in there that's the AGN location. You see that it's pretty much in the middle, and these three filaments pretty much radiate outward from it, okay? At least to some approximation. I guess it's worth saying that's the beam size for those who can see it down there, and this is one arc second, uh, 42, 30, sorry, uh, yeah, one arc second between the, the digits, if you can at least see where they are. OK, so this is fairly small scale. But on this system, by the way, uh, one arc second is about 1.9 kiloparsecs. So we see these three filaments. They have a total mass of about 4.6 billion solar masses. They sit within about 5 kiloparsecs of the centre. In this case, and you can see this here, you see clear absorption, uh, dust absorption, associated with the northern and the southeastern of these filaments. We don't see absorption associated with the third filament, but there's star formation going on in there, so it would be hard to see in any case. Okay? The uh, level of the absorption is up to 50%. Now, the point is that if you're absorbing by dust sitting in a galaxy, to absorb 50% of the light, you've got to be sitting in front of at least 50% of the stars, which means you have to be on our side of the mid-plane of the galaxy. Okay? Um, we assume, in fact, that it's likely that the covering fraction of these uh, dust clouds is probably not 100%. Uh, I mean, the scales that we resolve are of the order of a kiloparsec here, and molecular clouds have scales that are a lot smaller than that, you know, more like parsecs, 10 parsecs or something. And so it's very likely that covering fraction is less than 100%. And so this level of absorption is probably consistent with everything sitting on the near side of the sky. Now, these are position velocity diagrams.
in each one, the offset along the bottom here is uh, measured outward away from the AGN, okay? So away from the center. And again, you probably can't read the velocity scales, but let me say here is zero, okay? And here is 100. And this peak here, which is the peak for the, this southeast filament, is at maybe 70 kilometers a second. So it's a low velocity and it's blue shifted. Okay, so you're on the near side of the midplane and you're blue shifted, it's outflow. Okay, and in fact, all of these show low velocities and primarily blue shifts. Okay, we don't know about the southwest film because we don't know where it sits, but these look like slow outflows again. Okay, so, um, so it does look as though we're seeing outflow here. The, the, there are, oh yes, the x-ray image is here, you see there's a cavity here and another one down here. Um, very roughly to get scales, this box is just a little bit smaller than this box, okay? Um, but sort of, so you see the cavities are at least in roughly the right directions. Okay, so this may be, again, molecular gas that's cooled in the wakes of the rising cavities. But the small velocities are actually becoming a big issue. Uh, we actually have observations of four of these systems. And in every case, the velocity spreads are smaller than you'd expect sitting in one of these massive galaxies with a velocity dispersion of the order of 300 kilometers a second if there's dynamical support for the gas, OK? So there are two possibilities here. We can come to the decreasingly plausible possibility that all this motion is happening close to the plane of the sky, so the projected speeds are just small by chance, but sooner or later we'd better see one where it isn't. Um, or the alternative possibility, and this is hard to avoid no matter what your interpretation, is that these cold gas filaments have short lifetimes. The point being that uh, if you let a filament go, it's very dense, it's just going to fall. And within about 10 to the 7th years, it's going to acquire speeds that are substantially larger than the speeds that we see. And so you, you really need the lifetime of these filaments to be short. The problem, that raises its own problems. What happens then is, if you're going to replace this amount of gas in that sort of time, you're going to need to replace it at about 300 solar masses a year. Now, it turns out, actually, if you look at the spectrum, the RGS, that is the XMM RGS spectrum um, of this system, its cooling rate is about that, remarkably enough. However, it gets rid of none of the real problems because the point is where does all this gas go if it's cooling at that rate? It's exactly the old problems that we used to have when we thought these things were cooling flows. And so it's very unlikely that that's happening. But if it's not transient, uh, if it's, well, if it's transient and has a very short time, then the question is why do we see cold gas in so many of these systems? So the basic point is we have a sort of rough interpretation for these things. Um, Radio mode feedback is probably cooled by, uh, fueled by cold gas, cooled gas. Um, we also see that the systems that, are thermal, that have cold gas are the ones that are thermally unstable, which is consistent with that. There's pretty good evidence that we at least lift low entropy gas by radio lobes. And uh, it also looks as though colder gas is moving outwards, and the evidence is, I think, getting improving for that. Um, Uplift promotes thermal instability, and that can certainly give rise to this cold gas. But at this stage, we're having trouble making things sit together in a consistent picture because of the small velocity widths that we're observing for these systems. So that's it. Um, no, so the point is that these systems are filled with A stars, which are shedding dust at a huge rate and they're distributed. So the point is if I have some gas that cools, it can collect the dust from the A stars. And I have to say, in fact, I hadn't appreciated until recently that the iron from type 2 supernovae actually would be a problem, oh, sorry, type 1A supernovae would be a problem if it actually got distributed into the gas, okay, because it would cool it too rapidly. We'd get too much iron. And so, in fact, quite a bit of that may also form dust. And in fact, there are reasonable arguments that that should happen. So I think the point is dust is being produced and collected is, is the way that we would account for that. 
That, that's right. Well, so, it, uh, yeah, so that's, that is one of the issues, is you need the dust to form the H2. But the point is, if you cool the gas, okay, and it's sitting there, and then it collects some dust from the A stars. I, I mean, I, I agree with you, I mean, in answer to Martin as well, the issue is time scales here. Can you get enough dust, and can you form the molecular gas quickly enough? And the answer to those questions basically at the moment are we don't know. I mean, I have to say none of us know a great deal about the, those particular things. Yeah, and also given the chemistry, because you see molecules in this kind of thing, you need a certain time scale to get up a certain kind of chemical abundance, right? Because the, these kind of time scales are getting pretty short. Yes, uh, that's right. I'm not sure if people have looked at it like... You know, yeah, well, so... Yes, I mean, I, it's, if you start to line up all the problems right now, there are quite a few. <laughs> Not just the issue of the narrow width, the line widths, okay? But I agree. I mean, the point is that it's clear that we don't understand the details of, of how you form the molecules. I, I mean, it's just true. But, I, I mean, the problem at the moment is I don't know enough about this to have very strong opinions on that particular subject. I, it's something that needs to be pursued. Yeah, well, that could be off by a factor of 10. Reduce the molecular masses by a factor of 10, and so the 300 smaller masses yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it, I, you're absolutely right, Larry. And I, I mean, to my mind, the best solution at the moment for this is that, uh, is that this X factor that's used to convert um, the line strengths into um, masses is wrong. But the problem is, it's very hard to sort of discuss that. I mean, there's a big literature on it, you know, and... In very different environments. Exactly. I, I, I agree completely. But let me say, just, just to sort of, <laughs> to confirm what Larry's saying, one of the many issues here is, uh, uh, one of the things I forgot to mention was that this 4.6 billion solar masses is several times the absolute upper limit on the total hot mass gas, a gas of mass of hot gas within this five kiloparsec region. And so, I mean, that alone is really a puzzle. How could you get that much coal gas in there? Yeah, well, I think, I think it's 1835 as well. Yeah, right. So, so I, I mean, I would be very happy if these X factors changed. Yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, well, I don't. Yeah, required observations to a, yeah. To a good calibration of the H2 to CO or the ratio. Yes, yeah. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, but certainly agreed. <laughs>